Thanks for joining us on Digging for Value. I'm Allison Southwick. As always, I'm joined by Taylor Muckerman and Joel South, energy analyst here at The Motley Fool. Today we're going to talk about the, some stocks that are popping and dropping, and we're also going to look at some recent deals in the space. But as always, first off, we're going to look at the headlines. Our top story um, comes to us from Bloomberg here. The Fed announced yesterday that it won't taper stimulus. The market loved it, and the WTI rose to the mind-blowing one-week high. Um, <laughs> I, it, was just, it was just an amazing response here. Uh, so, Joe, what did you think? Uh, terrible news for gas prices. Huh? <laughs> yeah. now, this, the WTI price really shouldn't be considered at all. It's You'll see jumps like this almost weekly, so really no pay no attention there. What I took away from this was, you know, they're keeping the exact same uh, bond buying. Interest rates are going to maintain at the same level. So you saw a lot of high-yielding securities really jump. MLPs in particular uh, had a big day yesterday, continued into today, and I think that's the big story. However, uh, when you look at it, six weeks from now, the Federal Open Market Committee is going to convene ag again, and this is going to be up to, for debate. Interest rates are going to rise long term, so it shouldn't really be a reason for, for these stocks to jump. And what's your advice for long term investors here when it comes to all the noise surrounding the Fed? Yeah, definitely. If you're expecting interest rates to rise, which we are, and you want to hold long term, you better look for MLPs that can, that can actually last through this period. And there's a few that I look at. In Enterprise Product Partners is one that has a history of beating the market in interest rate rising environments. It's a company that has a great distribution and they've increased it every single quarter for the last eight years. And there's a company that has consistently moved their debt maturity out. Cost of capital has stayed low and that's really what you need in an MLP to grow the business and increase the distributions, which is big. The next one I would look at is Kenner Morgan. Uh, this is a company that also is one of the biggest energy companies in the United States. And they have 17 years of huge uh, compound and annual growth rate of growing that distribution. So that's another company I really like. Like we mentioned, they have the assets, the, cap the cost of capital is low so they can expand their business as well. And they've been doing that, so I really like where they're at. They've had uh, actually dropped a little bit for some, uh, <clears throat> uh, the company came out and actually was talking about their maintenance capital. Um, and they uh, were saying that the company may be doing some things that aren't really beneficial for shareholders. However, the, the company addressed it, and I think that they're doing the right moves, so I really like them. The last one is Boardwalk Pipeline Partners, natural gas play. They're also a low cost of capital company, and they have a lot of tailwinds. They have their pipelines right next to a lot of coal, aging coal plants that, if natural gas prices stay low, that can convert and that could be a huge boost for them. Yeah, we talk about the Kinder Morgan family, and there was a 26 year old that came out with this on Twitter, probably just looking for some additional followers. So the CEO, Richard Kinder, came out, pretty fiery response, and so he. I think he quelled all the, the questions that investors might have. So A 26-year-old posted a tweet that caused the whole... They put together a report uh, kind of bashing some operations on their financial statements, but it was kind of unfounded, so we'll see. All right. The next story is, of course, uh, coming to us from Reuters here. The scenes of devastation in Colorado um, as a result of the floods have just been really overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they reported today that a damaged tank uh, spilled oil into the flood-swollen river in Chicago. Um, the, the devastation is so bad, it's really not surprising to hear that there was a leak, um, at least not to me. Uh, however, what uh, it was, turns out it was only 125 barrels of oil, which right. to me doesn't sound that bad, right? In the yeah, grand it, scheme of things, right? It's, it's really it's not. not that bad. 125 barrels is a drop in the bucket, uh, no pun intended for these companies, but what really happens here is you look at Mother Nature abruptly interrupting production, and that's where you see Anadarko Petroleum, one of the largest producers here in this region just north of Denver, um, and that's really where the bulk of the storms hit. So they shut down a little over 600 wells, which is a pretty decent uh, level of production that they have here in this region. Uh, this The area that we're talking about is their largest production region in the Rockies for them, and it's also their highest level of capital expenditures. So not only have they shut down wells, but they've also shut down pipelines. And you also look at a company like Encana, another big producer here, They've shut down wells as well, so I'm really kind of wanting investors to realize that these unforeseen aspects of Mother Nature can throw off not only the spills that you have to worry about, but also the production levels. And it just so happened that this is a big area for some pretty well-known names in the energy space. 
All right, our next story comes to us from the Barrel blog. Turns out Chesapeake is done with natural gas vehicles, and they've axed their seven-person department. The article points out that Chesapeake is looking to make money now, and natural gas vehicles cannot deliver on that. So do you think this was a good idea or a bad idea for Chesapeake? Well, I think it's a good idea for them because I mean, if you look at what the company was doing before, they were trying to build out long-term, not really going after getting that money now, and that got them into that debt problem. And, you know, if, uh, two years ago, Audrey McClendon basically had earmarked about a billion dollars for natural gas vehicles. So obviously they're really changing the strategy. You've seen that axing this department, axing a lot of other executives already. So I think, you know, they do need to go after and get money right now, really close that balance sheet that they have. And they're starting to do that. They're going to, starting to sell their non-core assets, not keeping them like they did where they're before in the uh, earlier regime. They were going out buying assets that they weren't even planning on drilling for a number of years and paying a top dollar for them. So they're really going against that going for the liquids plays to get that money. And what I really like about this this move and a lot of moves that he's making, capital expenditures are cut almost 50% this year, and they're actually going to start funding their CapEx budget from cash flow from operations. So they're actually going to maybe get some free cash flow eventually, close that debt, and this could be a great value overall. Yep, I agree. All right, our final story here is that uh, the Wall Street Journal is pointing out that the number of electricity generating units on commercial industrial sites has quadrupled since 2006, from about 4K to 10K. And some of the uh, examples they cited were pretty cool. Um, Kroger apparently has is generating power from bacteria that feeds off of the scraps of bread and, and produce and that kind of thing. Um, so I thought that was cool news, but this probably is not cool news for utility companies. Yeah, it's really putting that industry on notice. Uh, renewable energy in the residential sector has already got them kind of worried. Granted, it's probably several years down the road, but to see companies doing this on a much larger scale now is definitely worrisome because the industrial and uh, retail sector really does provide a lot of business to these utilities. So to see them installing solar roof panels, these biomass facilities that you're talking about with uh, Kroger, and then uh, you see other small town breweries doing this as well with their yeast products. And one thing I saw out in Sonoma was Budweiser actually had a couple wind turbines near one of their facilities. They had them completely branded, so uh, you're looking at companies moving in that direction as well. I'm looking at uh, Intel generating 100% of its energy use uh, from green sources, either on site or they're purchasing credits. So uh, moving Moving forward, companies are really focusing in on this. Whole Foods is a company that even purchases more credits than they actually than they need. So they're actually uh, over 100% green green energy company. So uh, utilities definitely have to watch out while they are still purchasing green energy from them. If this does like new facility that's becoming cheaper, you saw uh, Walmart talk about from 2007 to now their price per watt of solar has been halved, so a lot of their new facilities are going completely solar uh, utilized, so um, I definitely think the entire industry, not any utilities in Pacific, but the entire industry better watch out. All right, that covers it for the headlines today. Now we're going to look at some stocks that are big, making big moves, our poppers and droppers. Joel, you are looking at a stock that is popping today. It's Phillips 66. What happened? So what happened with Phillips 66, one of the board members from Berkshire Hathaway, uh, Meryl Witter, she came out and she had an interview and she was talking about she liked a lot of stocks right now. She was actually hoping the Fed would go and actually taper some of their decisions so the market would crash because mm -hmm. she said she wanted that to happen to even get better buying opportunities, which obviously she says uh, that doesn't ma matter uh, for her. She's a long-term investor, which we all should That's be. That's very Buffett, so, Buffett thing to say. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Course. So it was, it was interesting. Uh, she came out and said she really liked the refiners. It's a sector that's been pulled back this year. And in particular, she said Phillips 66. A lot of people were jumping on board, and I think that really is a great move. Uh, if you look at this company, they're really starting to move away just from the refiner. They're a diversified player, which you have to really like. So if you look at the segments that they're at, they recently had Phillips 66 partners that they spun off, which is their midstream. They're really growing their midstream business. And then their chemicals unit right now is one of the best in the space. They have the top uh, return on capital employed at 25% best in the industry. And that's also a growing portion for them, which is very solid. And then we talked about the refining. They're going to or actually go strategically with that by getting advantage crude, some more heavy crude into the refining, not really grow the business uh, too much, but they're really going to take opportunities to get the most cash out of it. And then lastly, they have their marketing specialties, uh, which is basically a, an area that they're trying to grow a little bit. They're looking to grow uh, their, their uh, marketing, which is the gas stations in Europe. And then they're also trying to get their lubricant business out. So, you know, I think that's a great move overall. And if you look at this chart, you can see basically right now for, uh, refining is about 50% of their business. They want to get refining equal with their chemical business, which is the JV with uh, uh, or 
with uh, Chevron, and then they also want um, their midstream to be about the exact same for the uh, for the revenue. So I really think that having that diverse approach and expanding the business in other areas, being that refining itself is so cyclical, mm -hmm. is a great way. This is a still a cheap company, obviously, as uh, Winner says. So who knows going forward? Uh, it looks like a good value, one that actually Warren Buffett owns. So you sound pretty enthusiastic about Phillips 66. I, I like them as a refiner. So, um, and it, staying on that whole refinery vein, are there any other companies that sh people should keep an eye out for? Or competition? What's the, what I, else should people be looking for here? So it, I would say that some other companies that might have a boost are some of the mid-con refiners that take a lot of light, sweet crude. Since the uh, plays, the sh shell plays in the United States are really starting to take off. So I look at a, a Western refiner or a Holly Frontier. I think if the uh, the WTI and Brent price spreads again, which is, could happen with the amount of oil that's being produced. Mm -hmm. Those are two of the companies that are closer to the plays. They won't have as much transportation costs that could actually benefit. All right. So the what, the stock that we're looking at today that is dropping is TransOcean. They are down today. What happened? Yeah, their stock needs a lifesaver. They're an offshore driller. Um, they updated their rig fleet on um, today. And they said that they did sell two standard jackups that were held for sale. So no big surprise here. The details weren't disclosed. And the fact that they are selling standard jackup rigs isn't a surprise either. The industry is moving towards high specification jackup rigs with Ensco and C drill. Huge backlogs with these with these rigs coming online. So not to, to see this leave their books is kind of a benefit for shareholders. So I'm not sure why it's down. They did say that their uh, estimates for 2013 out of service time rose by one net day. That's really not that much to worry about. Um, another news that this company is linked to is the Macondo spill. Halliburton, mm -hmm. uh, their guilty plea was uh, upheld by a judge for destroying evidence. It's just a misdemeanor, so it's $200,000. I mean, it's probably the salary of some mid-level executive there. So really nothing to write home about here. Um, and it's the only company that hasn't been criminally charged. So I'm not sure why the stock is down. The news is kind of just middle of the road for them. Um, but to say the least, it might be a good buying opportunity. It's a high dividend paying stock, one that we like here at The Fool. So investors should probably take notice. All right. Well, that covers it for the stocks that are popping and dropping. Now we're going to look at a couple big names in energy and materials. They've announced that they're having some garage sales and selling some assets mm -hmm. here. Um, and we're going to take a closer look. So the first one we're going to look at is, um, Taylor, what's going on with Vail? Yeah, this is the second largest um, mining company in the world by volume, predominantly iron ore based out of Brazil. They're selling some of their non-core assets because the mining sector overall has just been killed recently um, with asset write downs and lack of revenue stream. So looking at them selling their logistics business. I think they sold about a 40% stake so far. They're looking to market 26% more of that business to roughly hold about 40% left. Um, you look at this deal, what they've priced it at right now, is about two times earlier estimates. So they have been getting a good price for this. And you're looking at several thousand rail cars and also 600 locomotives, along with 13,000 kilometers of rail within Brazil. Um, the infrastructure there is in dire need of improvement. So they're not really looking to pour that capital expenditure uh, that's necessary to improve that. Uh, some of these buyers are, you look at the Brazilian Development Bank says $28 billion is needed to revamp this infrastructure. And what they've coined it as is the Brazil cost doing business there because the infrastructure can be so poor at times that it actually increases the cost of international companies purchasing uh, either oil or uh, mining material from Brazil. So to get this in line, I definitely think that um, Val, Val is doing the right thing here because they really needed to shore up some things. They've done really well over the past month or so but uh, they definitely need to, to grow some cash so they can concentrate a little bit better. All right, and uh, Joel, what uh, garage sale are you taking a look at today? Well, I'm looking at a company that's actually not going to finish a project that originally they were looking at to do, and that's uh, British Petroleum. And basically, they're, they were going to go in and ex um, expand the Mad Dog project. This is a $10 billion project in the Gulf of Mexico. Actually, it's in an area right by the Macondo spill, so um, you know that might be bad luck for them. Maybe that's the reason. <laughs> Obviously, it's not. But Louisiana uh, yeah, they're they're worried about this project because we've seen other. Uh, big oil companies get into offshore projects that run billions of dollars and you're seeing a lot of cost inflation and uncertainty that's really starting to hurt them. Yeah, talking about those offshore deals, you look at the Kashigan project in Kazakhstan, finally supposed to come online with commercial production in October. Mm -hmm. You're looking at companies with 16.8% stakes such as Total and Exxon, really finally kind of shedding this weight that they've been under because it's eight years in the running. It's supposed to come online in 2005. So they're maybe avoiding a situation like this. Yeah, I think BP is smart to actually sit out of this because uh, to, after the Macondo, it was, they had to come up with about $40 billion in asset sales to start paying and putting into a trust to pay 
uh, future claims. Yep. And what they did to run that money is sell a lot of their assets and a lot of the leaseholds that they ha already had in the Gulf of Mexico. So, you know, if they already sold them, they, this project is nice, but I do see them, that as a good move for them, mm -hmm. especially when they're looking at keeping their debt level low. If costs go up on this $10 billion, next year they still have some court settlements to go through. So if until those are settled and you can actually count on the cash flows that you're getting to keep that debt level where they need it to grow their business, uh, I think that's a good move because like these other companies, it could take years and years mm -hmm. uh, later after we were expecting to see some commercial produ uh, production. So I think that's a good move for them. Yeah, yeah. all right. Well, I think that covers it for us for today. If you're looking for more analysis for the energy and materials sector, we've got you covered at fool.com. And you can also follow us on Twitter at TMF Energy. So for Taylor Muckerman and Joel South, I'm Allison Southwick. Thanks for watching.